All right, we're in chapter 11 and we're looking at solutions. Now we know a solution by definition is a mixture of a solute and a solvent. There are multiple definitions on these guys, but in general, what is being dissolved is going to be the solute. What the solute is dissolving in is the solvent. The mixture together is the solution. If we put anything in water, even if water seems like it's by far the smallest component, water is always going to be the solvent. Now, <clears throat> solutions are completely driven by intermolecular forces, and our policy on this is going to be like dissolves like. The more similar the intermolecular forces, the more soluble a solute will be in that solvent. We're going to look at some definitions here. We want to consider soluble and insoluble. When a solute dissolves into a solvent, we say it is soluble. Salt, for example, is soluble in water. Bromine, which is nonpolar, is soluble in methylene chloride, which is a nonpolar solvent. If something does not dissolve in a solvent, it's said to be insoluble. But when we have two liquids, if a liquid is soluble, we do not use the choice of words soluble, we say it's miscible. And if it is not soluble, for example, oil and water, we actually say that it is immiscible. All right, so we've got miscible and immiscible. Now, there's a couple of things that solubility depends on. One is nature's tendency towards mixing, which is entropy. Disorder drives everything. And then we're looking at the intermolecular forces. So what is going to have to happen in order for a solution to, or solute to dissolve into a solvent? We are going to have to take our solute and we're going to have to break its intermolecular forces to get it into pieces. We are going to have to take our solvent and we're going to have to break it into pieces and break its intermolecular forces. And then we're going to have to take our solute and mix it with our solvent to get our new solution. If the bonds in the solute are too tight or the solvent are too tight or the bonds that are generated, the intermolecular forces that are generated when we mix these together are too weak, this will not happen. If they're fairly similar, and in fact, the more similar they are, the more likely this is to occur. All right, like dissolves like. The more similar the intermolecular forces are, the more likely they are to be soluble. Two nonpolar substances, carbon tetrachloride and benzene, will dissolve in each other. Ethanol, which is hydrogen bonded, will dissolve in water, which is also hydrogen bonded. These are completely miscible. They will mix together in any portion. Salt will dissolve in water. Salt, because it's got charges, and A plus and Cl minus, will interact with the water which has a negative end and a positive end. Now, this is not the same as an actual charge, but we know it has a partial charge, that partial negative and that partial positive. So this still makes it so we have similar intermolecular forces and ionic compounds will dissolve in polar solvents. Some, things like soap, will dissolve both polar and nonpolar, which is why we can put oil into water when we use soap. All right. Which of these substances is going to be more soluble in water? So we're looking at stuff that is either polar or ionic, because polar and ionic are what dissolve in water. So in this case, it's going to be salt. It's ionic. In this case, it's going to be ammonia. It has hydrogen bonding. In this case, it's going to be methanol, because it has hydrogen bonding. And in this case, which is interesting, both of these are nonpolar, which means all they have are London dispersion forces, but we know that as the molar mass goes up, the London dispersion forces go up. Therefore, chlorine will be more soluble in water because it has larger intermolecular forces. All right, which of these will be more soluble in carbon tetrachloride? It's going to be the one that is nonpolar. Anything that is polar or ionic will not dissolve in a nonpolar substance. So in this case, KBr is ionic, so it's iodine. Methanol, we know, has hydrogen bonding. Carbon disulfide is going to be, excuse me, wrong one. Carbon disulfide is going to be nice and nonpolar. It's linear. Carbon dioxide and HCl, HCl is polar. Therefore, it's carbon dioxide is a gas. Again, like dissolves like. Soap. Soap is very cool. Soap is a long chain of carbons. It can have single bonds. It can have some double bonds. These are frequently 11 or 12 carbons long. And at the end of this, it is going to actually have a carbonate ion. Now, that would be soap.
still carbonate at the end. If we had instead this long chain and continuing here, and at the end we had a sulfate, this would be detergent. The difference between soap and detergent is that detergent is mostly soluble. Carbonates can be insoluble, so carbonates, if you use pure soap, which most of us do not do, actually will precipitate out and leave soap scum, which is kind of cool. Now, detergents. Let's imagine we have a nice detergent here. This nonpolar end here is going to be soluble in oil. This polar end here with the carbonate will be soluble in water. So the nonpolar end will dissolve a little bit of oil into our water. Is, um, and so therefore, we can get nonpolar things dissolved into a polar thing. We need to talk about some terms with our solutions. We can have saturated, unsaturated, supersaturated, miscible, and immiscible. We know miscible, this is with two liquids. If two liquids dissolve in each other, they're miscible. If two liquids do not dissolve in each other, they are immiscible. If we have solutions, we have three options, unsaturated, saturated, and supersaturated. Unsaturated simply means you can dissolve more. If you can dissolve more of your solute, it is unsaturated. That would be, for example, a nice cup of hot coffee, and you put into this cup one, say, teaspoon of sugar. You give it a nice stir, and it would all dissolve in there. But if you continue to add sugar, and you put more sugar, and more sugar, and more sugar in here, sooner or later, you couldn't dissolve any more. And when that happens, you would get a layer of sugar on the bottom. When you can't dissolve any more, it becomes saturated. So no more can dissolve. It's going to be a saturated solution. Now, we can create special conditions where we can actually dissolve more than we should be able to. Um, this, for example, can happen if you change the temperature. So if you took your hot cup of your cup of coffee and you got it really hot, you might be able to dissolve a little bit more sugar into it. And if you cooled it down very carefully, you might be able to keep that solution, that sugar in solution. That would then become super saturated. You have more in the solution than you should. What can a super saturated solution look like? Well, one of the more interesting ones is gout. Gout is a super saturated solution of uric acid. Uric acid is a natural byproduct of our metabolism, and mostly we just excrete it out, but sometimes it can become super saturated. It makes these little tiny sharp crystals, and they crystallize and precipitate out frequently in the joints. Um, this is kidney stones or a similar sort of thing, where you get stuff that uh, it gets a super saturated, so more should be dissolved or more is dissolved than should be, and it comes out or precipitates in places where we really don't want it. Because these crystals are sharp, gout is very uncomfortable. 